All right, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your location around the world. I am Mark Wilson. I'm the host today for Ready Row USA. We're going to be talking about catching a career and making living, making a living with rowing. And we've got some great guests that are going to join us today. And um, we've decided that this topic is quite a large topic. So we're going to be dividing this into um, some smaller segments as we go along. But what I would like to mention here at the beginning is just know that we are part of the Rowing Chat Network. It's an international group, which you can see there on the screen, um, various uh, podcasts from all over the world. And, and we are Ready Row USA, and we're happy to be here. Um, today, we're going to be having Mr. Mike Davenport, as, who has been involved with rowing for just about almost four decades now and has written many books and different things. So we're excited to have him and Grace Lusak, who is a former uh, Olympian and um, works for Hydro as an online and visual coach uh, for the company. She's going to tell us more about what she does and what Mike does currently, some of his new exploits, as well as some of the things that he's done in the past. And uh, my name is Mark Wilson, and I work for All American Rowing Camp and AccuDoc. And again, we're happy to be here and happy to have you either live or listening later as your podcast schedule allows. We do have a few sponsors that we wanted to bring up to you. Um, Just Strong is a clothing company, and it is presented here on the screen, and it's about clothing. You can get uh, juststrong.com and happy to have them as a sponsor. And our next sponsor is um, the author Annie Vernon, who has presented a book called Mind Games. And I'm sure uh, if Mike hasn't read this one, he might be interested in looking at that as he is an esteemed author himself and has talked a lot about these different topics about determination and the psychology of athlete, elite athletes. So we're happy to have Annie Vernon's Mind Games as one of our sponsors. And also Rose and Thorn Active Bras. And I mentioned this last time I was on if I was a woman and wanted to row, wear a sports bra, athletic bra, I would want the Rose and Thorn one. But I'm not. So, but you can get a discount um, for various things right there. And um, we're, again, we're excited to have everybody joining us as your uh, schedule allows. And one of the things, again, what we wanted to talk about briefly were the different topics. So I'm going to go ask our uh, esteemed uh, technical director behind the scenes to go back to that screen real quick that we just had on the on air with the different types of careers. And then we're going to just kind of breeze through those. So if we could see that again, that would be great. And there they are. So we're going to talk mostly about coaching, which is various roles. And we're going to talk more about that. But then also there are boatmen, club administrators, directors who may not uh, may or may not have rowing backgrounds. We have suppliers. We have vendors. We have venues. We have hotels, you know, all those different things, repair services service providers, all sorts of different um, activities that get involved with the sport of rowing. So we're, we're, we want to talk so about some of those in future shows. But today, let, let me bring on board Mike Davenport, who's out on the western shore of Maryland right now. And Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about coaching and, and what you know? Well, been coaching for a while been coaching since 1980. It's a great profession and it's an interesting way to make a living in the world of sports. There's other ways to do it than this typical face-to-face. -face. I think Grace is going to talk about an alternative way than in person. Uh, it has its highs, it has its lows, it has its fun, it has its terrors um, in many ways it's the uh, it's the firefighters you know it's it's uh, there's a lot of boredom and then there's a lot of panic um, but it's really it's really a great way to make a make a living um, and i started in 1980 uh, finished rowing and after our last race we had a great race and then i can remember going back to the award stock and literally saying, what now? I felt I'd spent all those years training and being involved in sports, but um, especially rowing. 
Um, and I didn't know really what to do next in coaching. When I get back, my coach said, eh, you ought to think about coaching. And I, I don't know whether I should thank him greatly or curse him greatly, but um, it has turned out to be a great thing over the years. I think that's how a lot of people get involved with the next level. You know, a lot of times people are are really good athletes and, and sometimes athletes make very good coaches and sometimes they don't. But it does take that that prod, right, that little push from somebody who you have uh, mentored under or trained under to kind of have you suggest that. So that was a similar situation as, as I was as well. And maybe Grace has a similar story. But that's that's how a lot of people would get involved with with coaching, I'm sure. So what are, what are some of the ways, what, what, and Grace, why don't you introduce yourself, please, and, and kind of give us a little highlight. Grace is right now up in Dartmouth, New Hampshire. She's at a training camp and is based in Boston and works for Hydro and, and does some other things, too. So, Grace, go ahead. Yeah, so I um, started rowing in high school, and my first paid rowing position was actually um, working in the boathouse as the boathouse janitor. So nice. <laughs> first real job, and that was my first paid rowing gig. Um, so I've since uh, been on the national team, starting with the junior team through the senior and Olympic teams, uh, last competing in 2016 down in Rio. And Fantastic. Since, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and since then, I've worked in New York City for two years, working for Ernst & Young, doing the not on the water activities of consulting and mergers and acquisitions and brands and marketing. So moved this January to join Hydro, which is a company for live outdoor reality rowing. So imagine a rower rowing machine in your house where you can have a big TV screen with the view of the Connecticut River, of the head of the, you know, the Charles, down to Miami, and even New York. Um, and someone awesome. like me is leading you through a workout. That's pretty cool. That certainly is a great, uh, great thing. I'm sure lots of rowers and non-rowers, right? I mean, you're really looking for the total athlete market, I think, with that, with the, with the, with the product, right? Oh, definitely. Rowing, I think, is a great sport and good for, I think, everyone to try. It uses like 86% of your muscles, as we may all know, 87, depending on if you're grimacing or smiling. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and obviously a very efficient workout and great into um, like the full spectrum of age for being kind to your joints. Awesome. So what we've got here, uh, everyone out there, is, is kind of three avenues of, of coaching. I think of myself right now as a, as a hands-on coach. I do a lot of traveling clinics and camps and travel all over the world. Just got back from Croatia uh, last week. And since then, I've been in Ohio. And tomorrow, I'm leaving to go to Michigan to work a camp up in beautiful Traverse City, Michigan. And so I feel my, of myself as very much a hands-on kind of person, kind of like how it's Mike probably started and now we, and then we've got Mike who's written books and we're going to get into some of those things and he's got all sorts of really good uh, academic side of things but also hands-on it's come from his hands-on training and then Tara who's kind of that that hands-on person but isn't seeing somebody and correcting somebody but leading them through the the activity which I think is pretty neat how our little group of panelists here uh, formed up here so this is pretty exciting Mike tell us some about the different roles of coaches like the different levels and the different um, positions that somebody might get into well coaching itself is and I think the, the funnest part about coaching is the teaching part and that's if let's say you have a full-time job as a coach that usually translates to only about 15% of the job, the other 85% tends to be all those roles um, that some, sometimes are fun and sometimes aren't. So you're talking about fundraising and budgeting and managing and transportation and advising. The list pretty much goes on. And there's always that caveat is other duties as assigned by athletic director. So it's, <laughs> it's quite expansive. Uh, but the, what I've found over the years, and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of coaches, either in clinics or through uh, books and such, um, I find that the thing that really engages them is the teaching component, you know, where they're either, you know, on the water or in the boathouse, the tanks or such. And they're working with the athletes, seeing the improvement, getting the feedback, giving feedback. Uh, that tends to be the most engaging part about coaching that I've found. I'm not sure if Mark or, or yeah. you found the same. 
Yeah, personally, I would agree completely. And I think that that, you know, the on that and that's one of the reasons why I've kind of gotten out of collegiate coaching is that I really do enjoy my time on the water, um, I get to row myself a lot more and also get to interact with a lot of people over the course of a year. So I would agree that if, if you can try to make uh, make the on the water part more fun and, and more uh, a bigger percentage of your day or of your job, that that makes it a lot, a lot more interesting, I think. So Grace, what about you? How, besides being a boathouse janitor, uh, at what other roles of rowing? You came through the junior ranks of, of rowing. What other coaching roles are there out there? What Which ones have you seen and feel are very important to your, perhaps your development, but also the development of a club out, out in the wild world? Yeah, so I'm very lucky to have had some really fantastic coaches along my rowing career from you know, the sport of rowing to um, other sports as well, to be honest. And, you know, having the exposure, I came from a public high school. We just happened to have a river that went through town. Thank you, Michigan, for all the water. <laughs> and um, I ended up coaching while I was on the national team uh, for a season working with Mercer Juniors um, and their novice program. So I've had some hands-on experience and then just the breadth of being able to have the development camps in the summer as a junior and getting exposure to all the different coaches um, was pretty fantastic. So one of the things uh, that's great. And I think that one of the things that you just mentioned working with novice rowers as a, as an Olympian, or maybe at that point you were an aspiring Olympian, I'm not sure of your timeline, but it's really fantastic to have highly qualified athletes, coaches working with the newer the newer athletes, right? The people who are all excited about joining in the sport. Mike, do you have anything to kind of comment about the level of coaches that maybe you would suggest a program start, you know, where, where somebody would start and how they would develop themselves? Well, that's an interesting thing. And you would think there's a, a set hierarchy, you know, you, you, you start here and then you end up here and it's a straight line. And it's, it's not, it's just the opposite. It squiggles and turns. Um, and sometimes there's big gaps in between uh, when people get into it and actually how they get into it. What we tend to see, uh, and we've, th there's been a lot of studies on this, but we tend to see is that people get into coaching um, in, the, in the United States. And this, we're one of the few countries that doesn't really have a national coaching certification program uh, across all sports. So uh, people tend to get into it kind of differently, kind of like I did or Grace did or, you know, mark yourself. Um, but they usually start at the bottom, whatever the bottom is. Maybe it's the janitor in the boathouse. Maybe it's the volunteer coach or it's just being at practice as kind of a manager type thing. Uh, and, you know, you, you think it's you go step one, then step two, then step three, but so often uh, that's not quite the way it goes. And uh, luck, uh, being in the right place at the right time is such a big, a big advantage to uh, moving up the ranks of coaching. I've seen it actually happen where we've had a volunteer coach come in at the college ranks and within a year he was the, he was actually the varsity head coach for a basketball program just because of illness and a coach had to leave and such. So, um, luck plays a big part of it too yeah and a, a willingness to do the do the work that needs to be done right i i would agree i think that uh timing is often is often the, the deciding factor as we all know coaches are highly sought after around the country all you have to do is to look at the classified section on row 2k and know that there is a huge need for more coaches so um uh, grace one of the, what if you were uh if you were talking to somebody, somebody came up to you and said, hey, I want to get involved in coaching per se. What would be some of your advice to get them the the needs or the, the not the needs, but the, uh, the means to be an effective coach? What are some of the things that you would want them or suggest that they should do? Well, some actually a, a structured program that I recently learned a little bit more about training and working out of Boston is CRI's coaching development program. And a couple of my teammates uh, who are training were also doing this program as well. And um, I think that's pretty fantastic. Like they have the, um, you know, classroom time. They get coaches coming in to give them uh, personal sessions to discuss like what we're 
um, you know, Charlie Butts, like top three pieces of advice and having experts from the field come in and actually get, get, get all that like into one place, which I think is pretty cool. Um, for like me personally, I just started by, uh, like knocking on the door of the Mercer juniors club and saying that I was available and looking for a position. So, um, I think just being communicative and starting to reach out and connect is like you said, there are lots of opportunities and just making sure you get the right, um, mentor and kind of see the potential for the path, even as, um, was said earlier, like it could be a little bit broken or like up and down. And um, I think it's good to have a mentor and someone on your side. Yeah, I would agree. I, I was fortunate in my in my background to have actually Charlie Butt, who you just mentioned. He was one of my oh, scouting yeah. coaches, as well as uh, Liz O'Leary and and Jim Deed. So I felt I felt pretty privileged to have those three on my uh, uh, scaling coach, you know, scaling coaching background, and and uh, pretty cool to have those. And I think that's one of the things that I would recommend to anybody who's getting involved with the sport is to go out and be mentored. Uh, ride and launches. Really? I talk to people all the time who want to get involved with coaching and, I, and they say, well, how do I get started? And one of the things that I like to suggest is just go and sit in a launch. You know, maybe it's Mike's launch, maybe it's a hydro launch, maybe it's, uh, you know, a collegiate coach's launch that's nearby you at any level, you're going to learn good things and you're going to see things that aren't working. And I think the coaching needs more of that hands on uh, exposure and experimentation to make sure that people see good and bad as they as they move along and decide that they want to coach juniors or maybe they want to coach masters or maybe they want to jump into the collegiate club ranks or maybe you know volunteer and then work themselves up into the collegiate or national team level so there's all sorts of different levels for people to get involved with coaching and, and I think it's really important that people just get out there and, and ride in the launch you know I think that's that's one of the things that I really suggest to people all the time and not to disregard the novice, you know, I think personally, and that Mike, I would love your insight on this, but I think that the novice rower is should be that person or that group that really gets the most energetic and the most excited and the most, uh, passionate person to help them, uh, get on the, get the right foot, get on, you know, take those first good strokes and get those first strokes um, that are really in a good way. So any thoughts on that, Mike, you know, what you're, how you would suggest somebody getting involved as coaching novice? Oh, I, if you're going to coach novice, I think if you go into it with an attitude of having fun and helping people find the enjoyment of rowing, I mean, we consider, so many people on the outside consider rowing such a, a stoic sport where there's very few laughing, uh, very few laughing sessions, very few smiles, and it's really opposite. So if you've got the, the warm and fuzzy and outgoing outlook and you can make uh, practice fun, novice is a, is a great place to start. And you may even stay. And I have friends that have been in coaching for years and years, and they actually go back to the to coaching the novice instead of the varsity because they really enjoy that part of it, showing the, the great stuff about rowing and the engagement part and, uh, you know, the giggles and the smiles and those type of things. Right. Uh, so, so yeah. yeah. So, so I was just going to ask Grace to kind of give, she, you started Grace as a junior rower in, in, in Michigan. So obviously the season is interspersed with some winter time, right? Some of, that some, frozen, of that. some of that frozen stuff. So I grew yeah. up in Wisconsin, so I'm pretty familiar with all that snow and ice. But what made you get through that freshman winter or that mm. first year, that first year of rowing winter? What, what made uh, you persevere? Um, I played other sports. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it did. I was actually, so I started rowing my sophomore year. Um, my older sister, who's uh, a year older than I am, she, my mom read an article in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, and the first line read, do you have tall daughters? My mom was like, yes. Uh, do you want them to go to college for free? She's like, yes, yeah, sure. Why not? Uh -huh. um, have them try rowing. And so I started a little bit later in high school and I kept up other sports as well, which I think is good from like a coaching and um, body awareness as well as as an athlete, kind of good for your body and mental state to be doing other sports. But then by my junior year, I was doing both um, rowing practice in the winter and volleyball practice. So music helped a lot and having a team there and 
Um, kind of one of the cool things about hydro too is that our a lot of our community they know nothing about rowing, and you do have those cold, dark winters where you want to see. I prefer to see a view of Miami in my living room and right. have someone instruct me through it, and then you feel like you've got the team there because the, the isolation that comes sometimes with that training. Um, as a coach, I think it's it's important to figure out how to bring that environment and music and the team and moving as one unit with the rhythm are things that I found very helpful. Right. Yeah, I would think that that would be one of those things through uh, through the cold, dark winters of, of Michigan or Wisconsin or New York or Massachusetts or wherever. Having having that coach who's energetic and passionate about and showing being able to show the that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. That's what you're doing on a daily basis. And that's what Mike talks about. I think a lot in his books is making sure that you're keeping the engagement with your athletes as positive and as, uh, you know, know that there's an end to that winter time. And, and there's always spring, you know, spring always, always comes. So I think that whole mental aspect and Mike, maybe you can touch base on the mental aspect of coaching to make sure that your athletes, you know, continue to persevere and, and improve and stuff. What, what kind of feedback would you give to that? Give that to the coach. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Got to meet the athletes where they are. Um, so often we as coaches, especially when you get a little bit older or you're a little bit different in position than they are, uh, we tend to forget what they're really looking for, what they're trying to get out of it. We tend to assume that it's exactly what we want is what they want. And that's not necessarily the case. So, uh, you know, if you want to keep them motivated, you got to find out what they're really after. And it may be something totally different than, than you are looking for. Um, and you've got to meet them where they are. I think that's one of the biggest things. And I think successful coaches at every level have done that. Uh, they've identified what the athletes want, have explained, explained it to them and to themselves. And, uh, uh, and that's yeah. changing, right, Mike? I mean, that's the big oh, yeah. thing right now is that every every few years, I mean, the real focus of what they want or even at different levels of, of teams, it changes. You know, so yeah. once you ask the question once, you can't just keep going back to that same thing that like winning isn't the only reason why people start anything. Right. So there's always has to be that intrinsic motivation that they're that they're that you have to identify. So your job as the coach is to identify that ongoingly, right? Yeah, and that's part of a culture. You have to build a culture that, that you know, with a team that uh, allows people to express that. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, people's reasons why they row for, will change over the course of a not only a season, but maybe within a month or two, especially go back to a novice, the first practice they may be there only because their roommate dragged them down there. Sure. Um, and so they went there just to keep peace in their room. Well, a week later, it might, might be because they wanted to get out away from school and just to, you know, get out in the open. And another week, it might be something different. So you really got to keep your finger on that to figure out what what is their motivation to be there. It's tough, right. um, but it's important. So I think go ahead, Grace. I was just going to ask your feedback there, please. Yeah, I think too, looking to, I mean, you've got the high school and college rowers and then like the huge world of master's rowers as well, like and adults that are new to rowing and, you know, the motivation of just being able to find a little bit of time to get in some exercise, like find people that are experts that can, you know, some people loved the mastery of the skill and the sport of rowing. We have this repetition and this synergy and this rhythm to the sport. And I think that, you know, those are some polling motivators and you have to kind of keep your pulse on, okay, this is maybe not everyone is training for the, the Olympics and doing this full time. And like, how can the, this time that I have as a coach or whatever capacity, like maximize it for um, the rowers? I, I think that's, point. That's yeah, I think point. that's really well said, Grace. And I would agree with you hundred um, percent. Everybody needs their own little thing. So I talk about taking fewer, better strokes. It's part of my of, of, part of my coaching. And I think that's something that we all can kind of remember. It's like it's not just about going out and taking a whole lot of strokes. Um, so maybe just thinking about better strokes and, and seeing the birds fly by or the water float by or the, you know, whatever happens to be going by out there on the water and enjoying that. And if you take fewer, better dolphins strokes, you're getting in Miami. dolphins <laughs> in Miami, manatees here in Florida. Yeah. What do you got, yeah. Mike? 
Uh, we've got Canadian uh, Canada geese oh, on wow. the docks. A lot of Canada geese on the docks. Yeah, that's for sure. Hey, <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, and out on the west coast, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, seals and different things out there too. We're all kind of east coasters here, but uh, but anyway, that's great. Hey, we're gonna wrap this up. I want to thank Mike and Grace so much for joining us today. I thought this discussion was fantastic. I hope you guys out there in podcast world uh, enjoy it, enjoy it as well. Whether or not you're listening to now or or uh, or later, appreciate you guys being out there here on the rowing rowing chat network. Um, so we've got a little uh, contest every game every. Uh, Every episode, we give away a little something. If you put out on your social media out home the hashtag RRUSACatch, uh, you could potentially win a little session with uh, an online review from myself, or you could maybe get a book or two from Mr. Mike. And uh, so we're looking at, at seeing some things uh, come your way out there. But I just wanted to say again, thanks very much to our sponsors um, who we need to help keep promoting the great sport of rowing here in the USA. And if you are a business owner or have any interest about becoming a sponsor, you can contact us through our social media. Please reach out. And again, thank you, Mike. And thank you, Grace, for joining us this morning. Any final words from you guys? Have fun. There you go. Yeah, go out and row. Go out and row. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you so much. Yay. All right. Is this where the audience comes in and goes, yay? Yay. This is where the... <laughs> All right. Uh, we're not done yet. <clears throat> no, okay. uh -oh. We're still rolling. Thank you for... Uh for being with us. This is Charlotte. I'm the producer and I will close it out here in a second. Thanks. The principal's here. Don't say the principal. Anything. The principal's going to close us out. All right. Be careful. Be careful. Hey, Grace, how about a fist bump there? Good uh, job. Good job. Yay. Yay. <laughs> nice job, everybody. All right. We've got a few of our other sponsors, I guess, are showing up on the screen, which is great. There's Pierce Press, Nancy Disner. Find our sponsors at rowing.chat hashtag or backslash sponsors. And uh, again, thank you very much to Mike and Grace for joining us today. It was great having you both join us. So thank you. And great, thank you, fun. Charlotte. You bet. My pleasure. All right. We're going to go offline. <laughs>